Flutter has a lot of state management options, but today we're going to be talking about Block, one of my favorite choices for state management in Flutter. We'll also cover the differences between blocks and qubits, how to incorporate blocks into your Flutter widget tree, and then we'll show some examples in a real life application that touch on everything we're covering now. Like I mentioned before, Block is a predictable state management library for Flutter, but you can also use it with Angular Dart or even just Dart. It's an alternative to other state management solutions like Provider, Riverpod, Redux, Inherited Widget and Inherited Provider, MobX, Binder, and many more. Blocks help you keep business logic out of your widgets when building a Flutter application. They also allow you to easily test logic and widgets separately. For example, when my state is X, my widget should be doing Y. Blocks also allow you to record interaction with those blocks through a block observer. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, Blocks provide scalable conventions for teams of any size in a growing code base. Defining a block is fairly straightforward. You'll create a new class that extends block, and you'll provide types for the events and states that your block should support. You'll provide an initial state for your block, often this is a loading state, and you'll set up event listeners and handlers in the constructor. Our handler functions take in the event of that type as well as an emitter of the state that we're supporting. Once we're finished doing our business logic, our block will emit a new state indicating that something has changed. Perhaps we've loaded our data or maybe we failed to load our data. Events are also fairly straightforward. You'll use a class to define events. Generally, you have a root class for your events, in this case, pet event, and you can use equatable to help prevent duplicate events from triggering back to back when your block processes them. Your event should have properties that represent all the data they need to perform whatever the event is intended to do. For example, if you're loading a pet, you'll want to pass in the UUID for that pet. If you're adding a pet, you might want to take in a uh, instance of that pet object that you're wanting to save to the database. Defining block state is also fairly straightforward. The state is what's emitted by the block, and your views react to changes in the block state. Views can also react to state changes without changing the widget tree. You might use a scaffold messenger to show a snack bar, or maybe just show a dialog. Additionally, you can leverage equatable to avoid triggering duplicate emissions of the same state if nothing has changed since the last time it was emitted. Now that we've covered the basics of blocks, let's talk about a simpler alternative, the qubit. Qubits don't define events, but they do still define states. Instead of adding an event to the block, you just add a method on the qubit and call that method. Now, you're probably wondering which one should you use. Block has more boilerplate, but a smaller API surface, just dot add. Because of this, blocks are way easier to mock in widget tests because there's less public members. And blocks also allow you to capture the event flow of your application. You can log this to Sentry, Firebase, etc. It also assists in debugging. Equatable events help prevent duplicate events from triggering, like on a double tap, and since qubits don't use events, you don't have that luxury. Finally, Block has an event sync, and while that's out of the scope of this video, if you really want granular control or the ability to transform your events on the fly, you're only going to be able to do that with Block, not qubit. However, the main reason to choose a qubit, honestly, is that it's a lot simpler. There's less boilerplate, and it's generally easier to wrap your head around, especially if you're starting out with the block library. What's really nice is that they actually operate fairly similar, so you can swap out your choice later if you realize that maybe qubit wasn't right for you, or maybe block wasn't right for you. Let's take a look at how blocks work. So we define events. In this case, we have a load pet event, a delete pet event, and an update pet event. We can call petblock.add and pass an instance of that event to the block. That block will do some logic. Maybe it uh, has a service that it calls or a repo that it fetches data from. And then finally, that handler will emit state. Qubits are extremely similar. The only difference is that we don't have those events. So these are now methods. So you would have something like petqubit.loadpet or petqubit.deletepet. And these methods is where you would put that business logic that blocks might have, such as calling a service or a repository to fetch data. And then in these methods, you would also still emit state. So which to use? Uh, it really depends on you, your team, and your use case. If your team values traceability, blocks have a clear advantage over qubits. 
If your team is having a hard time mocking qubits for testing, blocks also provide an advantage there. But if your team is struggling to model event transitions or find it unwieldy, you might want to start with qubits. And if your use case is really simple, you may just want to use qubits in general because it'll likely be a little easier. So how do blocks and qubits come together? Well, it's through block base. Both qubit and block extend block base, and the block base class is what's expected when adding blocks or qubits to the widget tree. This also provides the interface that the block widgets use, like block builder, block consumer, and block listener. We'll get into those more in just a moment. But the nice thing is that this allows blocks and qubits to be used similarly in the widget tree when building your Flutter application. The block builder is a Flutter widget for listening to block state changes and creating widgets based on that state. State changes trigger a rerun of the builder function provided to the block builder, and an optional block parameter can be provided, although if you omit it, it will look up a matching block from the widget tree. In this example, we have a block builder for pet block and pet state. Our builder function looks at three different states, whether it's loading, failed, or loaded, and then ultimately if there's a state that we don't support, we're simply just returning an empty container. While these if statements are empty, this is where you would create new widgets and return those to conditionally build your widget tree based off of the block state. Our next widget is the block listener. This is a Flutter widget for listening to block state changes and executing code when those state changes. Again, state changes trigger a rerun of the listener function. An optional block parameter can be provided, but a mission will look up a matching block from the widget tree. You don't want to create widgets here, but you might do something like set state, maybe pop the navigator, or show a snack bar with a scaffold messenger. In our example here, we have a block listener set up for the pet block, and we listen to state changes. If the state is deleted, we go ahead and take the user back via navigator pop. If the state is pet updated, we show them a snack bar indicating that the pet has been updated. Our next widget is the block consumer. This one's really straightforward. It combines the block listener and the block builder together so you can have both a listener and a builder. If you're serious about using block, make sure to check out the API docs. There's way more to these widgets than listed here and you can provide functions that help determine if the widget should be rebuilt or if the listener should trigger. Again, this video is just covering the basics and will eventually be out of date, but blocklibrary.dev should stay up to date as well as providing more information. I've mentioned that several widgets will look up a matching block from the widget tree if you don't manually provide one. This poses the question of how do you get blocks into the widget tree? Well, Block Provider is here to help us with that. The Block Provider is a dependency injection widget. It allows us to add blocks to the widget tree, and it allows other widgets to get that block and add events to it, or call methods for it in the case of qubits. Now that we have a high-level understanding of blocks, let's look at some actual code. One of the things I mentioned about blocks specifically is that you can actually record changes to blocks. To do this, you'll create a new class that extends a block observer and override the onChange method. You'll call super onChange to make sure the blocks still work, but you may want to do things like print the block and information about the events that it's processing. We can create an instance of that block observer, and we will add that to our block overrides.runzoned. The details about block overrides is probably out of the scope for this video, but the documentation should have everything you need. And who knows, I may make another video talking about that. If we look further down, we can actually see our app build method. And if we search, we can actually find an instance of our pet block that I've mentioned before. We're using the block provider widget that I've mentioned to create a new instance of our pet block, and we're passing an instance of the pet repo to the pet block since that's a dependency for it. If you have a lot of blocks like I do, you can use the multi-block provider widget to nest all of your blocks roughly at the same level instead of having to nest block provider inside of block provider inside of block provider. Now let's take a look at the pet block. As I mentioned, this class extends block and takes in a type for the event and state, in our case, pet event and pet state. You see that we set up our initial state and we have our listeners provided in the constructor. 
This block's actually really simple since the repo's doing most of the heavy lifting in this case, but we emit a loading state, then we fetch our data, and then we emit loaded or our success state. Let's look at how we can consume these blocks. So the simplest example is going to use the pets block. We haven't talked about this one yet. There's a block for pets and a block for pet, but we have a list of data and you can see here that in did change dependencies, we're using block provider of to add a new event to that pet block. In this case, when our widget dependencies change, we want to make sure we're loading the correct pet. In our build method, you can see that we're using a block builder with the pets block and the pets state. Our builder function has conditionals for if the state is pets failed or the state is pets initial or pets loading. I'm going to take a second to clean this up really quick. As this is a really good spot to show a circular progress indicator. Now we can take a look at the loaded state. And you can see here in this conditional that we are getting state.pets and setting that equal to entries. And then if entries is empty, we let them know, hey, you don't have any pets yet, let's add one. But if that's not the case, we use a list view builder and we pass in our state to that list view. Let's take a look at one more file. We'll look at our pet.dart, which is a view specifically for details about one pet. This is the view that uses the pet block that we talked about. So you can see here, for example, we're using block provider.of to get the pet block. And if it's existing, then we add an update pet event. If it's not existing, we add an add pet event. And these events will trigger any mounted block builder, or block listener, or block consumer. I hope this video taught you something new about the block library and perhaps whether you should use blocks or qubits in your next Flutter project. If you learned something new, I would really appreciate it if you liked the video. And if you want to continue learning new things, subscribe to the channel and click the bell to make sure that you get notifications of any new videos that I put out. Thank you so much. Have a great day.